Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, and I'll defer some comments to Tim. Did on everything, bro. <laughs> Did on everything you said, and um, we've come here to listen. So I, I think I'm happy you turned out, and um, look forward to what you have to say. You may have questions, you may have comments. All is fair. So look forward to it. If we're breathing too heavy into these, just holler at us. So whoever wants to be first, we didn't take numbers. Sharon. Oh, you you just came to watch, listen. Well, I'll, I'll I'll start because nobody else is, and um, you know again uh, we appreciate everything that you do. You're you're great, both great supporters of UW Rock County and the UW system. And uh, as you know, the Joint Finance Committee is meeting right now uh, to talk about UW system. They're probably talking about us right now. And uh, certainly there has been some discouraging news out of Madison uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and I, I, you know, what's most important to us is that our faculty and staff uh, are able to get some kind of pay plan. Um, as you know, um, our pay has been, that the faculty and staff have not seen a pay plan in five years. Uh, and in addition to not seeing any pay increase, they've seen they have uh, accepted furloughs and increases in increases in contributions to their health care and their retirement benefits. And and it's fair. Uh, prior to the the last biennium, our faculty, I like to say, had the Rolls and staff had the Rolls Royce of, of of benefits packages, and now they have a Cadillac. So they're really it's a really good benefits package, but nonetheless. They have seen a, a hit in their take-home pay. And who I worry about most, in fact, are our lowest compensated faculty and staff, uh, because our lowest compensated, in, in particular, staff in the last, with the increase in contributions to the benefits package, have seen a uh, decrease in their take-home pay of about 12% uh, these last two years. And that's a really hard hit for them to take. And, and nonetheless, they have continued to be the best advocates for our campus and provide service to our students like no other campus I've seen. So um, they're, they're amazing people and they don't let pay interfere in, in what they do for our students. But, but at this point, I think it's critical that they do see some sort of increase in compensation uh, in their pay plan. And, it, it, and any little bit helps. So anything that you all can do to support that, we would be ever so grateful. Thank you. And I'll just make a comment that education has taken a drastic hit the last biennium, and um, they're not making it in any way, shape, or full form whole against, again, this biennium. So I think it's important, and I know that there's been some concern about the UW budget surplus, but um, Tim and I were just talking, when we were on school board here in Janesville, we talked about that in open and put in policy that we should have budget surplus because you certainly don't want to operate in a deficit and have something extraordinary come along that you couldn't handle. And I agree, it's, it's um, some of our the workers on the other end, you know, on the lower end of the scale, it's just that this has been a very hard, that's why there's less expendable income in the economy because um, it's just, you know, just, hit him very hard. So I, I can certainly empathize, and I certainly support that. So. I, when I was running in 2010, I said over at Whitewater, before all this surplus stuff was known, that I thought that the 6.5% that the, uh, after 6.5% after 6.5% tuition increase was indefensible in the time of inflation, as people getting Social Security checks know what inflation has been. And that, that I thought then that, that we ought to cap tuition increases at somewhere around two or three percent, uh, and now we find all this out. And as Deb said, the difference between what the Jamesville School Board did and what the university system did—not you, Board of Regents, and the leadership in Madison—is they didn't tell the world what was going on. We always told the world what was going on. The school board was always in the Jamesville Gazette. People knew we had a surplus, and so now, um, I mean, I, I definitely support the, the tuition freeze. I mean, the because the freeze will force the university system to draw down a little bit of that surplus. What I have a lot of trouble with is in the additional money for the university, um, which 
was 181 million at one point. I don't know what they've got to chop down to now. 60, 80, something like that. I don't know, maybe it's not even that much. Well, in the, in the governor's uh, proposal, it was about 94 million. Uh, it looks like the proposal from the Joint Finance Committee, I, I, I got it, and I've skimmed it. It's it's a little unclear to me, but it looks like they're they're cutting that down a little further. Um, and I, but I'm not entirely sure because. Well, there's all kinds of good causes up there, and some bad causes that get money. Uh, but my view is, I, I view the tuition freeze as something that helps students and families. It doesn't necessarily hurt the faculty who had nothing to do with this surplus growing and keeping the secret. And so I, my view is, we should try to save as much of the of the money that's in the budget for the university system that's crucial to Wisconsin, not to the students, but the economy, everything. And so I just don't think it's right to draw down this $181 million to almost nothing. Um, it, it, it punishes those who are not responsible for what everybody's mad about. And so um, I hope we can save that, um, some, as much of that money as possible. And the, the state senate's an interesting body this time around. It's, it's been, it was lockstep with the governor the last two years, and I'm not sure it's going to be um, this year. But there are several Republican senators who have trouble with a lot of pieces of this budget, and we'll, they're going to get a lot of pressure to get in line. We'll see if they do. Um, I think some of them that I've talked to feel strongly enough they're going to hold, hold out, and there may even be, we may even get to a point where there's some floor amendments to pass with people from both parties. So um, that's still not a likely scenario because they're going to get hammered pretty bad to get in line. Um, the Republicans in Deb's house, are, they're already in line. Uh, but there's there's a little mini rebellion going on in the Senate over a bunch of issues, Medicaid, university, uh, vouchers, etc. several things, rent to own. Yeah, and I would say that, um, you, you know, I'm not sure how the surpluses, how that happened. Uh, I will say that, um, uh, and I don't know that I want to call them surpluses, I mean here on our campus we do have uh, some money that I like to refer to as an enrollment buffer because we have, our enrollment is not necessarily stable and in fact this semester we took quite a hit in enrollment, about 15% and our budget is very dependent upon our enrollment and um, we have, so our enrollment can plummet pretty drastically depending on the economy and many other factors and we have contracts with people that provide services to our students that we need to honor so we can scale back those services but that takes a little bit longer to scale back than you know a huge hit in our enrollment so we do have this enrollment buffer to be able to continue to pay people through the end of their contract um, but I but it's not a you know, as, as has been characterized as slush fund uh, in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, what, at, while I agree it is important to keep education affordable, and that's our primary goal, and we've been fortunate at the colleges to have had frozen tuition uh, for four of the last five years, um, to be able to do a pay plan for our people requires ongoing funding. And so that is, there's two sources of ongoing funding. There's tuition increases, or there's increase in GPR. And what I heard you say, Tim, is that you want to see the, the, the GPR funding continue. And that would be very helpful because that would hold our students harmless and be able, allow us to be able to compensate our employees in, in ways that are, um, uh, you know, getting back towards what other schools do. Um, I'm very worried about uh, if we don't get pay plans, as I've said, we, we, I, I've had uh, three faculty at this point who have told me that they're leaving at, uh, for next year, they're, they're leaving at the end of this year, and they all cited pay not as the only reason, but as, as one of the reasons. And, for us to lose three faculty out of 29, you know, 10 percent of our faculty is is that's going to be a that's going to be a hit, and and they're great people, and 
and we're really sorry to see them go. And I'm sure we'll be able to hire new people. That will also be great, but, but it does become challenging when the compensation, when people get so demoralized about a continuing lack of compensation. So we, again, really appreciate your support about the GPR budget and your, your empathy uh, for our faculty in the situation that they're in. So thank you. And by all means, I want to express that I think it's a good thing for the tuition, tuition to be frozen also. Um, we have been having lots of sessions on what student loan debt is creating in this country and how it's just become a drag on the economy. And so it's, it, I think GPR dollars will be important because we don't, it, you know, the UW system is vital to the state, you know, regardless of what any powers be might say. It's, it's very important to the state and to the development. And, both in small business and just technology and you know the body of knowledge. So, anyone else? My name is Andy and something I work for Riverfront and thank you for the opportunity here. Uh, I kind of want to switch the conversation over to healthcare. Uh, Riverfront is an organization here in town that helps individuals with developmental disabilities and. My question leads towards managed care, and what are your thoughts on managed care expansion? As you know, uh, uh, Rock County is one of the few counties left that has not expanded into managed care. Where do you see it? When do you see it possibly happening, the switch over into Rock County? What are your thoughts on it in, in terms of the positive aspects of it, the negative aspects of it? Um, if you can enlighten us a little bit on that. You're talking about family care? Yeah, family yeah. care. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't, there's no reason why it isn't expanded to Rock County. There's like five or six counties up in sort of the Green Bay area of the state that, that want it. And then there's Rock County sitting down here alone. 57 counties already have it. And Dane County. And Dane County doesn't want it for a variety of local political reasons, I guess. Um, it, it's a, it, it, I don't think it's very well known by the general public what family care is. I think if you went out street and ask what family care is, most people wouldn't know. If you asked what Medicaid was, they'd probably know where Medicare or something like that. Uh, but it is it is a great way to give people a chance to, to uh, avoid being in institutions and live as much of their life as possible, as free as possible, um, outside of institutions. And I, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. We, we may get a chance in the Senate to add some counties, I don't know. Um, but um, Rock County has been left, you know, being kept being promised, you know, next year, next year, next year, uh, and I don't think there's a justification for not happening. But, but I, I, you probably have a different perspective, so I think you should actually express that perspective because I think they have a different perspective on family care. Well, we do. I, it, it is a wonderful thing for individuals who receive the services, but I'm not so sure it's a great thing for the providers who provide the service because at Riverfront is all over the state, so we have. Um, regions that do partake in uh, uh, providing services where there is family care providing it. And what has happened in those areas is that uh, we're, we're expected to provide the same service but for much less. Uh, it's, I think the concept of family care is to, to get those who are waiting for the services to get those services, which is great, but it's the same amount of money to provide those services. So if Rock County has a thousand people on the waiting list, um, and there's an 18 month rollout for those services, so within 18 months, a thousand people are gonna come off those waiting that waiting list, and the providers that are in the area are expected to pick those participants up and provide those services for the same amount of money. So in essence, Providers such as Riverfront and, and Can Do in this area um, and CISA 2 are, are expected to pick up that for less money. And, and that's how the providers are affected with that. I mean, and that is a simplistic, excuse me, a sim simplistic version of it. Um, and I'm wondering, have you heard that from other areas? Well, you know, I've, I've had experience. I've actually talked to Riverfront and some other providers in, in communities, and they have the same concerns about the HMOs coming in and taking over the care. But you know, I think it really depends on who you get as your provider. I mean, as you, who you get as your management corporation. Because um, when I've heard some different places, they think, I mean, I've even heard of providers in those areas saying that it works well. 
I mean, the advantage of family care is getting people with disabilities um, services without any waiting lists. Here we have individual providers that provide services, but there are waiting lists. So, you know, it has to be a happy mix. And I, and I don't know how, first of all, you're not slated or not slated to get it, which is a concern to a lot of people that they're not, because I do know people that have also been in my office that have concerns that they're waiting for services. So I, I do understand that, and I, but it's, it's not slated right now to have family care in this, although we have the Family Resource Center now. But I do think it involves who do we get to do, who's the entity that will be doing the managed care. And I don't know, will the providers, and you, you'll know more than I do, will the providers have input into that? Probably not. I, I do know of one um, managed care organization that has submitted a request for audit to Rock County, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly the term on that, but I, I, I believe they put in their request so they can look over the financial, the Rock County's budget situation. So, uh, but we won't have a say. Okay, and I, I certainly do empathize because I, I, I know that all people are being made to do more with less. And you know, when a push comes to shove, I think we'll, we all want to work together. I mean, I think the can do in Riverfront, did I say it right? Riverfront, yeah. do a great job. You know how much I appreciate what you guys do out there. I mean, it's a phenomenal place. If you've never visited, they do a lot of good things out there. It's, it's a lovely facility. Yeah, um, I've been there too. I'm trying to figure out, so I'm not saying it's you, but are there, your organization, um, maybe can do it. There seems to be some invisible pushback to getting family care in Rock County. And I'm wondering if it isn't organizations like yours. Because the county really wants it. The people on the waiting list really want it. I'd like it. I'm fortunately not on a waiting list right now. Yeah, and that's the advantage is <laughs> it gets rid of the waiting list. No, we at Riverfront have nothing against family care. We want to be able to work. I mean, we we do. We have a responsibility to be fiscally responsible as well and manage to our budgets and you know understand what it means to have family care come in. And we we have a, a I guess a benefit as I was explaining to a mother earlier today. We have the luxury of having uh, organizations throughout the state where we get that experience, but we have seen other organizations, not Riverfront, but other organizations uh, close their doors because they couldn't afford to stay open from the reimbursement that they were getting, the, the, where they would normally be getting uh, rates cut in half, essentially. What percent, is there a percent of, of the people you serve that are on Medicaid? Do you, almost all of them are. Almost all of them. Yeah. So do you, do you get a voice in so you can run, still run your, the HMO would just be the distributor of the funds? They wouldn't directly affect your management. I mean, they'd affect your management by how much money you get, but they don't directly get involved in the management, right? Not necessarily. They, they are, they provide the care management, which essentially is case management. So they have social workers that oversee what we do. They authorize every aspect of service. So whatever type of service you have, uh, they put it in their category, just like an insurance company. This is what you'll get paid for it. This is the code you, it falls under. This is what rate you get for that. So um, they're not only the funder, but they also provide the, the case management and some nursing oversight as well. Okay. Well, I guess you can tell, you know, it's a quandary for us too. I mean, I, I, I sympathize, but I also sympathize with all the, the people that are on the waiting list. You know, when they, when they see family care in other districts, that um, they're being taken care of. And I always thought it was probably part of the management of whoever's taking care of the HMO. But I, you know, I, that, I, that I don't have any experience. Well, it's my impression and opinion that the MCO is a business as well, and they need to be responsible with how they, they run that business, too. Um, there was... Uh, Managed care organization up up north, um, community mm -hmm. health partnership. That didn't do very well. Didn't do very well. Yeah. They closed their doors. So yes, they need to be responsible as well. So. Oh, right, that's true. So anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate you. that. Uh, Anyone else? No.
Nobody has an opinion. <laughs> Stan, you don't get an opinion. Yeah. No report from Milton, even? Uh, our, our negotiation process is going fairly well at this point, I can report, but not due to the governors. It's just to the concentration and the goodwill of the people. I'm not patting myself on the back, but our board is, you know, uh, we understand the dilemma. Our hands are kind of tied in what we do. Um, and then we continue to hear this stuff about expanding voucher programs. Uh, without accountability, you know, is there any way that you can get that off that budget bill? I think there's a chance. I think, I think there is a chance. I hope so. I really do. It's going to hurt. It, it's going to help more districts than just, you know, the ones in this particular area. Yeah, the districts who think that there are 424 districts in the state. And this this budget bill um, proposes to expand it to nine more districts, but there's a lot of other districts around the state who think that. This, this isn't their fight, it's just these nine districts. This doesn't stop with these nine districts. This, this is the goal to go statewide and as fast as they can, and it may take them a while, but that's, that's their goal. And if, if you're being a, um, yeah, other thing I would say in terms of um, how, how the board relationship is with teachers, is that one of the, it's either intended or I think maybe even unintended consequence of Act 10, taking away the collective bargaining right, is it, it has made teachers similar to Major League Baseball players. They're free agents. Uh, now they're not making what Major League Baseball players make, but this, this elimination of their collective bargaining rights and the, and the protections they had in terms of their benefits, all that that's gone with Act 10, they now are a union of one, each one of them. And what's going on around Wisconsin is that some of the more and more urbanized areas of Greater Milwaukee, where there's another school district just a few miles away, so you wouldn't have to move your home. You can stay at your home. Is that teachers are, are are shopping school boards that are responsive to them, who want them, who care about them, and uh, they're going where they're wanted. Uh, and it it also um, can occur here. I mean, we're, we have, we have enough school districts within driving distance; people can move. And so, boards who want to be think they can be tough because they got Act 10 behind them. And I can, very short sighted. I can echo exactly what you're saying because we're in a pocket where it's very competitive. Um, we've lost teachers headed to Edgerton, um, and I'm sure they're probably realizing some loss as well as they're competitively shopping also. Um, one of the statements I made at our meeting with regard to you know our, the negotiation process that we've had is the fact that I can't, and it's more philosophical than anything else. From my perspective, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but I have problems supporting um, these particular funding policies the governor uh, has in his budget bill at the expense of our, uh, our district employees. And I'm not just talking about faculty, I'm talking about uh, our custodial um, and, and other support staff. I mean, it, I can relate to the newspaper business. Our biggest, our biggest. Uh, this is the world's now, by the way. In terms of Milton School Board. Can you get a microphone? Uh, well, no, I, I'm just going to use my gym voice, okay? Um, but I, I think the issue that we have is that we're losing, or, or the, there seems to be a morale problem. It's not a money problem per se. It's just that there just hasn't been a way that our educators have been able to improve. In financially for what I personally feel that they deserve. Uh, I was brought up um, with the understanding that education is something that you can never take away from anybody. I, and, and we're supposed to be um, in a country that, that, that puts a priority on education, and I'm not seeing that done statewide. And I commend you and, of course, um, Tim, uh, Deb, you're great. I mean, and Andy, in our 43rd assembly district, you all have your heads screwed on, right? You're all, we're gonna see some changes, but I just wanted to echo the struggle that we as school board commissioners have in trying to run a balancing act on mandates that are coming down to us that actually handcuff us because there's no money. The zero 
funding uh, proposal for, per student is killing us. So, you know, I, all I'm here to do is just kind of let you know that in Gruntsville, where we're, you know, dealing with this stuff that's coming out of Madison, it, it's going to hurt us more than it's going to help us. Well, for everyone else, the governor raised the revenue limit for schools, for public schools, zero dollars. So they're, help, you know, I think since it's the second, I mean, the two, the last biennium that we've lost about five hundred dollars in spending ability in, to inflation, et cetera, in the school districts, and we're holding them to zero dollars. So when they say, "Oh, you're not really losing money," you know, you're getting the same amount of money. Well, no, you're not. Nobody, I mean, anybody that runs a business, if you everything is always flat, says, "I'm losing money," if you in, in, include inflation, et cetera. But so we hold public education to zero dollars, and we give out, you know, public or private voucher schools. 29% increase. And um, there's none of the same accountability. I mean, this is something really near and dear to my heart, and I'm, I know it is to Tim's too. You know, um, there's not any of the same accountability. They don't have to have, you know, they don't have to answer to the public. They don't have to hope, hope, you know, open meetings. There's just nothing that says we're accountable to the public, like a public school is. Is there anything that's more scrutinized in a, in a community than at school? But if it goes to a private voucher school, that scrutiny goes away. You know, just the dollars go to it. You know, you don't, you can't request anything of them. Um, it, you know, they've included private school um, voucher schools for special needs children. Those children can go to that private voucher school. They don't have to provide the services. They're not required to. They get the money. The child then decides. You know, I. I I'm not getting the services here. I'm going to go back to public school. Those those dollars stay with the private school until the next the next student count. So um, there's just nothing inherently um, fair if you're if you like public education. Um, there's just nothing inherently fair in this um, budget, and, and it's it's very scary to me. Um, and when Tim says it could happen to any district, it could happen as soon as the governor puts a pin to one word in the budget that says nine. You know, then all of a sudden, all school districts could have to pay for voucher schools. And that does have an impact on us. Those are GPR dollars that can't be put towards public education. You know, if um, people will have to, you know, school districts may be forced to go to referendum just for operating costs, how often, you know, that's just a hard thing to get past. It's, um, it could be a nightmare. And I agree. What part of public education is not in our history? What part of making this country what it is is not in our educational system and that we believed in public education in the first place? So I agree with you, and I wish you luck. Well, I don't recall it being as political as it used to be. <laughs> that's true. It never was. It was uh, public education was always a bipartisan matter. Absolutely. In fact, former Governor Knowles, late Governor Knowles, who served in the late 60s, he wanted to, he wanted his legacy. Served three two-year terms. He had two-year terms. In. He wanted his legacy to be that he was the education governor. That's what he wanted to be. And then there was no voucher thing. So when you said education governor, it was a public education governor. That's what a Republican governor wanted his legacy to be. Even though he had a great record on the environment and other things. Too. So there was, when I was in the Senate the first time, um, organizations like the Teachers Union would endorse several Republican state senators around the state. They didn't endorse just Democrats. Um, it just wasn't partisan. And I never thought I'd live to see what's going on today. People, people aren't willing to say, well, the public school teachers are worse today than they were 20 or 30 years ago. They aren't willing to say that those who want to do this culture stuff. They say they want to give parents a choice. They get, they grab the word choice. Um, but if anything's changed in the last 30 years, it's, it's, the, it's the life that children lead outside of the school. It's what kind of environment do they have in their home, whatever constitutes their home or whatever stability they have or lack. I mean, they, we got a huge number of kids, a lot of times tied to poverty, but not just tied to poverty, certainly not tied to race. They have a terrible life outside of school. Nobody cares about them. Nobody's home. Nobody reads to them. Nobody feeds them. Nobody hugs them. Nobody tells them they're great. Nobody cares what time they go to bed. Uh, nobody cares if they do their homework. 
Then they show up at the public school at 8 o'clock the next morning and don't do well. And we've now said, it's the public school's fault. We've got to give the parents a chance to move. Well, in their best circumstances, if you assume that these voucher schools are terrific. What are they going to be able to do about that home life, those 17 hours when they're not in school? What are they going to be able to do about that home life any more than a public school can do today? I, mean, I, I find this, this is actually a giant political movement, as I'm sure you know, this voucher program. This is not an educational movement, it's a political movement. It's nationwide, millions of dollars of campaign contributions involved in this, just in Wisconsin. And um, that's what's going on. I, I just, I find it astounding that, 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 pub, that kids aren't doing well in school coming out of that environment. And it's, we, we already have teachers bringing toothbrushes and toothpaste to school and they have, they have part of the day set aside that for all the kids to brush their teeth because nobody's making them brush their teeth at home. I mean, even stuff like that. You get, they get clothes, they got washing machines and dryers in the, in the elementary schools to be able to wash the schools, the kids' dirty clothes at school because they're not getting washed at home. I had a kid in one of the elementary schools in Janesville, parents sent home a uh, notice to get signed by the parent to go on a field trip. Kid comes back the next day, doesn't have it signed. The uh, uh, teacher says, well, why, why, whatever his name or his or her name was, why didn't she get it signed? And the kid said completely matter-of-factly, not, not with any amount of, of um, shame, he just said, well, my dad's in jail and my mom was passed out on the couch. And, it, and the teacher said it, he said it in such a casual way that that's, that's life for that kid. That wasn't a special day that was different than all the rest. And uh, so to, to deal with, with all those challenges that, that teachers face, and they're doing everything beyond being a teacher, and then somehow it's the public school's fault that, that it, the graduation rate isn't 100% or or the test scores aren't way up here. I, I'm, I'm astounded by it. And the good news is there are several Republican state senators who have a big problem with the expansion of vouchers. And it will be interesting to see how this plays out in the Senate. I'm somewhat optimistic, although they'll get an enormous amount of pressure to get in line. Peter, I see you standing there, but I just want to make a couple comments back on schools. It's, uh, it's ironic that for bad, the expansion of badger care, the governor considers 100% of poverty the level that um, people should be enrolled in badger care. But for private schools, it's 300% of poverty. So it, it's just, and we had a, a showing from DPI, or the meeting yesterday with DPI, and they showed us the scatter plot. So the governor does have built in his budget some competitive grants. Well, actually, they're not competitive. On the upper end of the school, for schools that are succeeding, or you know, overly exceeding, they get some, can get some money through some grants, but they're all on low poverty schools. It's just a, it's just a mad, it's amazing to see the scatter plot. So all the people that might get extra money are already relatively rich districts, and they're already succeeding. The kids on the lower end that are, where the schools exceed, you know, 40 or 50 percent of poverty, the schools are not doing as well. They're in poverty and they have to compete for a lesser amount of um, grant money. But they have, to, they have to do compete with each other if you're on the low end of the spectrum. So it just seems very backward. And I'm sorry, Peter, you've been standing there for a long time. So. <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, if you want to talk about school somewhere, that's fine with me, too. But, uh, <laughs> that's actually not what I came here for. So, okay. um, so my name is Pete Severson. I'm about 18, 17, Leslie. Um, and I actually have come to talk about the third branch of the government, the court system. Um, it's often forgotten in the news, not covered very well, um, but I wanted to address some of the budget issues that are facing us as a court system. Um, I am an employee of CCAP, um, the Consolidated Courts Automation Program. Um, so we are the IT department for the, the court system throughout Wisconsin. Um, roughly about 3,400 users. We provide all the hardware, software, training for everybody that's in the court system, all the clerks um, throughout the state, 72 counties, and all the agencies of the Supreme Court. Um, and we are looking at a $17 million lapse in our budget. A nice word, not a budget cut, it's a lapse. Um, we face that same lapse last biennium. 
Um, however, with the changes to WRS, um, our, the appropriation wasn't changed, um, wasn't reduced by the, our WRS amount. So that $10.3 million um, dollars that we as employees paid for our WRS um, covered part of that lapse. So it made the lapse less painful. Um, however, this year, the governor has proposed again another $17 million lapse, and that is going to be very painful to the court system. Um, it's a court system that operates on a shoestring budget as it is. We are a very small portion of the state's budget. Um, I couldn't find the exact figure what, what our total appropriation is, but it's not much in the scheme of things. Uh, and so I um, just wanted to reiterate some of the things that Chief Justice Abrahamson brought forward to the um, Joint Finance Committee. Um, with the lapse that we are facing, we're going to be looking at, at case delays likely. Um, just not being able to move things through the system as, as quickly as, as they should be because there's just not the staff and the equipment um, and, the, and the resources to do that. Um, it's also going to cause some um, anti-revenue, basically. Um, a lot of what the court system, the clerk's offices do around the state is to do collection. Um, so if somebody gets a fine, um, they're not paying for a while, the clerk's office there has to go out and try and collect some of that money. They use collection agencies, they use um, tax intercept, um, and they bring that money back into the, into the state system, a large portion of which, you know, that funds what the court does, but it also funds other, other agencies. Um, DOJ gets some of the money, um, Revenue will get some of the money from the tax intercept. So, you know, by cutting our resources, those collection, those collection um, opportunities are going to be lost. Um, the part that gets to me close is the information we're, information technology. We are uh, going to have to scale back a lot of the equipment that we're purchasing. And you know we we've operated you know we CCAP is about a 70-person operation, and we are basically the IT department for the entire state. Um, most corporations have ID, I, IT departments that big just for divisions of their companies. Um, so we do a, we are very efficient, um, very well managed. Um, but this is going to we're already seeing it kind of towards the end of this biennium and trying to get some equipment purchased because we know we're not going to be able to get it next biennium. So um, certainly there's going to be, and you know, equipment breaks. We just can't, you put PCs out on everybody's desk and in all the courtrooms, things just break. They just, I mean, that's just the way equipment is and they need to be replaced and it's going to be replaced at a slower pace and um, going to cause issues there. Um, also, judicial compensation is a, is a real big issue. Um, I like people to understand that you know the judge, a judge's other opportunity is to be an attorney. They can make quite a bit of money being an attorney. They make a decent living being a judge, but um, you know again, as the dean had talked about, if we don't keep those compensation levels where you know they they want to do the job and can do the job at that that pay level, um, we're going to start losing judges. We're already having short, some shortages and delays in getting some of the judgeships filled. And the last thing that Judge Abrahamson covered was access to judge justice. So um, one of the things that really slows down the court system is, is pro se hearings, um, people representing themselves, because it, the court system is really built on having attorneys. And so when those attorneys aren't available or aren't because the people don't have the resources, um, it slows the process down, and um, Chief Justice Abrahamson has been very proactive in setting up pro se resources. We have um, pro se websites that they, people can fill out all the paperwork that they need. Um, some of the bigger um, courts have pro se offices where people can come in and get some assistance. They, you can't give them any legal assistance, but at least help filling out the forms so they're doing that correctly. Um, and some of that's going to start going away if we lose, have this budget lapse. It accidentally, well not accidentally, I went up to the joint finance when Chief Justice Abramson was speaking, and she was talking about a double lapse, and at that point in time the joint finance 
seemed to be taken aback that it seemed like a double lapse, and they thought they might correct that, did they? Um, as far as you know? I don't know that for sure. Okay, because they were just talking, but they were surprised when um, the Fiscal Bureau was saying, no, it kind of ends up being, in the, so anyway, that's kind of double just I, I mean, we don't often hear in the, in the news about the court system. It's kind of the silent partner in government. Um, but it's going to be a problem if we start losing all this money. So I just wanted to bring that attention. I appreciate that. Well, there is sort of a general disregard up there, I think, in this majority party for the justice system as a whole. I mean, not just the things you've talked about, Pete, but um, they're, they have legislation which will, the legislature will attempt to tell the court system how fast they have to act on their decision making. Uh, we pass a law, a, uh, a judge um, puts a stay in the law, questions the constitutionality of it. They got a bill which says that if a lawyer simply appeals that stay, just appeals, a lawyer is in charge now, appeals the stay, the stay is automatically lifted. Um, I mean, that's the, the let one branch of government, I think we all studied this at one point in our lives, one branch of government telling an independent branch of government how to operate, on, on what time frame. And then uh, assistant DAs, which is, you know, everybody wants to see, you know, the, the, the sixth time drunk driver um, prosecuted and so on. They passed legislation, they put it in the budget bill for assistant DAs that they can only get pay raises the first three years that they're an assistant DA. From that point on, as long as they stay an assistant DA, they can, have, they can get something called a cost of living sometimes, so they're, not, they're zero. But there's, they can never be, in, there's, never, there's three pay levels, first year, second year, third year, and then no more. And so what happens is you end up with assistant DAs going off um, to, to private practice and somewhere in their fourth or fifth year, and then we who want to see justice um, have a bunch of really young assistant DAs up, up against some really experienced defense lawyers, and we wonder, you know, uh, without enough of them, they, 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 they plea bargain things down, and we go nuts because we read in the paper that somebody did something awful, and it was plea bargained down to probation or something. Well, they have a lack of staff and lack of, of, of qualified staff and, and veteran staff. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's across the board. Um, this. Because I think the real reason is what you said, Pete. Is you're sort of the silent um, branch of government, so we can we can whack you around a little bit, and the public you know, never has a chance to see the connection between not paying an assistant DA and then not having uh, cases get get um, prosecuted and prosecuted successfully. Um, and, and I will say that the, the DAs. Are part of the executive branch, so that's I mean they're not under the court system, but you know we are obviously the recipient of their services, and um, so if they're not you know if there aren't enough DAs available to prosecute cases, they they can't move through the judicial system at all. Huh. I mean that's why I said sort of justice system, the whole the whole area. I guess I, I don't want to monopolize if anybody else needs to talk, but I did want to kind of give a, a plug for um, state workers to a, um, the, the dean covered it pretty nicely, I think, as well, but um, I just wanted to give you kind of a personal, my example. I am a state worker. I've been a state worker for about eight years now. Um, I have not seen a raise since July of 2008. Um, and in, let's see, 2009, 10, we saw furloughs, and then the last biennium, we started contributing to our WRS and paid increases in health care. Um, so, and it's, I'm not complaining for myself. I, my salary's okay. I, um, I don't just blame the Walker administration necessarily. I think it started with um, Governor Doyle. He, you know, um, in 08, we were actually, that, that biennium, um, we were looking at getting 2%, well, we were gonna get 3% raise that biennium. They split it into a two and one percent raise. We were supposed to get two up front and then one at the end of the biennium. They went and switched that around, even went one and two, and then at the end they took the two away. So we only got a one percent raise at biennium. Um, and 
you know, it, it's not a, like I said, for me, it's not a, I, I'm managing, but I look at it long term, we're not going to be able to attract state workers anymore. It's, it's going to get harder and harder to, why would somebody want to come work when you can't see a pay raise for six years? Um, I think it kind of reflects a, kind of a disregard for all human resources when it comes to working, not only for the state, but I, you know, I think we've seen um, falling wages in the state for the last couple of years, and, and we're not, you know, we're way at the bottom when it comes to wages in the state, I think 45th or something, 45th wage increases. So I, I think there's a, we should all be concerned that, you know, Wages are in Wisconsin are just not keeping pace with the rest of the nation, and that's that's a big concern. And sir, and the reason I wanted to come to the listening session and kind of say something is that you guys actually control what you know, I can't control what corporations are paying people, but I can ask you guys to okay. um, you know to look at the compensation for state workers and you know and hopefully we you know I'm not asking to get rich doing state work, but um, I don't want to get poor doing it either. But I'm. Glad that you think we have control of something. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Good evening. Tom Bryan, 19160 East Racine Street, Apartment 8, Janesville. Uh, tonight I come wearing one of my different hats. Um, on the board of directors of Black Hawk Credit Union, and I'm also on the state uh, legislative committee for the League for Credit Unions. One of the things that it's uh, got tucked into the budget was the um, want to abolish the Office of Credit Unions. They want to uh, roll it into the DFI. This is a proposal that, and actually there's no cost to the taxpayers at all because the credit unions are the ones that fund that office. The credit unions did not ask for it. The governor didn't ask for it. But the, the bankers were the ones that proposed that. They say that the credit unions like it. Well, we certainly don't. And so that's one of the things that they have in the budget right now is to abolish that. So when you said the governor, whose budget is it in there? If it's not in the governor's budget? Well, it's in his budget, but he, he wasn't, he didn't, it wasn't his original request to have it put in there. Okay. The bank, the bankers were the one that put it in there. Yeah, but it's his budget, so it's his request. Are you saying it was added by the finance committee, or was it in his original budget? It was in his original budget. Well, then it's his item. I mean, okay. No, it's yeah, whatever, whatever he told you, it, it was but anything. In I started budget. getting emails on this the last few days, and according to my staff, this, this is something that the bankers would like to do. They, I guess, when I think about it, they were checking to see if there's any legislation to do this, and there's none. And uh, but now you're telling me they were looking. I, maybe they were looking for separate at separate bills. But you're saying it is already in the budget. That's, that, that's not the, what they found out. It's supposed to go to joint finance first. So I don't know if that's where it's. Well, that's where the budget is. Okay. That's where the bill is. The budget. Because I think it's uh, tomorrow, or I don't know exactly the exact time, but joint finance was supposed to look at that within the next few days. That's why you're getting the emails and stuff now. But I'll check tomorrow morning, but I, my staff said this was this was something the bankers want, but it's not anywhere in legislation. But like I say, they may have only looked at it separate bills. They may not have looked at what whether it was in the budget bill or not. Mm -hmm. they, they told me that this is something the banks would love, but, it's, but there's no legislation to do it. So I'll double check. Yeah, that's from what we've been told, and like I say, originally the bankers, when the discussion started, the, we supported it and we didn't have a problem with it, which was not a true statement there. And the thing there, apparently the banks want more transparency. They want to be able to see what everything that the credit unions are doing. And since they're a separate branch now, they don't have access to all the information that they think that they should have. Well, I'll, I'll find out tomorrow. We'll get back to you, Tom. But I, they were telling me that this is something that the banks want, but it's not in legislation. Mm -hmm. But I'll see if it's in the budget. I'll, I'll leave this with you. I know they got the whole credit union establishment stirred up around the state. I know that. Yeah, and we just, I think we just got a letter two days ago, maybe. So okay. that was the first we knew of it, too. 
Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Tom. need a microphone I can talk so my name is Joel and I just I don't know if it's really a question but it almost seems like there's a, a nationwide attack on public education you can almost get the feeling of it when you turn on the night in the news and it's not just Wisconsin I know Chicago I just saw they were talking about closing 45 to 48 schools they claim there's never enough money, but they always seem to have enough money to give to a corporation to start jobs that really don't pay enough anyway. So is that kind of the direction that Wisconsin's headed is to follow the rest of the country? Is that where we're headed is to abolish public education and to privatize it? No. There's a national movement to diminish public education. They don't want to destroy it because they want to have a two school systems private system and a public system. But the private system wants to cherry pick the kids they want to take. And so that's why I say they don't want to destroy public education. But you're on, you're, you're on to it correctly. They want to diminish it, but they still want it there because uh, they don't want to take the kids that are enormously disruptive, the kids that have disabilities that are that are really cost a lot of money and they need aids with them and additional assistance to get through the school day. But the private schools, the private voucher program, they don't want those kids. They want kids that are profitable. So they want to leave a public school system in place, which will increasingly um, have difficulty reforming because they're going to cherry pick all the kids they, that they can. So, yeah, it's a nationwide movement, but it's to diminish public education, not destroy it. And could it be a, a movement that only uh, rich, privileged kids will have the best education, or say the poor kids like in poverty? that may be having trouble at home, they don't stand a chance now, let alone going to a, a lesser of a school when that takes place. So it almost seems like we've, for years and years, education's always been number one, but now it seems to be fading off into the past. Well, when you were talking about for-profit, I don't know who was on the school with me when um, Bill Bennett came through and he was trying to start up an online school system that would, you know, take dollars out of public system and, and actually be a corporation that would generate lots of revenue if you could get children to sign up, you know, through choice on an on, online school. So there's, you know, I, I, I agree they don't want to uh, destroy public education because they always want those dollars to be available, you know, for kids to move from place to place. But I have the same concerns you do. I mean, I, I think that education is the great equalizer. And I would hate for it to revert and become the great divider. And, and we already see that happening. You know, we see the haves and the haves nots in, in schools already. And so I agree. It was always the thing that kind of equalized us as, you know, we went through the educational system. And I, I see that happening less. Thank you. Deb talked about the, uh, the percents of, talking mm -hmm. about 300% for public, for voucher schools and then the Medicaid number. But the, I think it makes it even more stark when you put it in. In actual dollars. Um, this budget says that if a family of three makes more than 18 grand, um, they, they're not eligible for Medicaid. But a family making 70 grand can go into the private voucher program and take the public money with them. Actually, you, talk about, <laughs> you talk about, in my view, these messed up priorities. They're, they're, there they are right there. Thank you. Yes. I'm John Winkleman from Beloit, and I have two quick questions, I think. Uh, and we hear varying things about whether we might see a little more than zero in school funding. There's various pieces, maybe in the Senate, maybe not. So I'm interested to hear on what your current prediction might be today. I realize that might change in an hour, but it would be interesting to know. And then, you know, we all saw, many of us saw in the paper, Beloit 78% free and reduced lunch, right? Travesty, right? But part of that goes to where do we have jobs? And jobs is supposed to be what we're all about. So I'm interested in where's this budget taking us in terms of growing our jobs? Because if we don't have those in Janesville and Beloit, we're going to have 78% free and reduced lunch, and we'll continue to have the poverty question. And actually, I will address the first, the last first, because I, I'm a freshman there, and it has been 
mind-numbing the lack of talk we've had about jobs. We talk about everything else, getting people off food stamps, um, changing the court systems. We talk about everything, changing the Milwaukee County board structure, but we never talk about jobs. And Senator Cullen has something, with, unfortunately he was associated with WEDIC, but some venture capital, that would be the first thing to come through that would actually talk about jobs. So it's, um, you're right, it's, it's, it's very scary, so. And we're actually restructuring the bill. Um, oh, I? To not have, it, have it, anything to do with WEDIC. It's gonna be um, another way around, but WEDIC won't touch the money and they won't decide where it goes. Um, and uh, there's Republican support for it too. Um, the, um, the, I guess, I think the finance committee put in a $150 a kid increase, a student increase. And there will be an attempt in the Senate to go to 200 or 250, but that's basically what the governor's budget was zero because right. he put some money in but took away your ability to, live, right. to, to raise property taxes by the same amount, so you end up with zero in, in the classroom. But there's 150 bucks a kid in, in the budget now, I think, largely because of the, new, the better revenue estimates and they took the money from the university. Um, but be that as it may, um, it's sad to see the public school system played off, but you are the beneficiaries of UW's problems uh, at, at, at the K-12, pre-K-12 system. So I, I think the 150 will stay, and it may get to 200. I don't know that it ever gets to 250 per kid. Senator Collins, can I ask a question? So the 150 you're talking about, that's per student funding increase, but they're not raising the revenue cap, so. No, if, if you have a per student, they, that would be above, that would be, that'd push, it. That'd push it, the revenue limit. Right now, right now it's zero. He's putting some money in, but it's zero percent revenue increase because it's just going to the property the tax. Proposal was zero. Not raise the re revenue cap, but give some money back so that right. it got returned to property tax. Right. This is act This money will actually get to the for people. And I think the assembly will ask for two seventy five as their bottom line over the biennium, and I think that was going to increase. Five in the 500 million range, but when you consider that the last biennium they lost 1.6 billion dollars, you know it seems plus the addition that oh no, not anywhere no. coming out of this. We're still cutting like crazy. You know, and, and Act 10 was good for one year. You got you got the benefits one year, and then everything after everything after that is right. you still have you still have the cost of living. You still have eventually, hopefully, some sort of wage increase or new programs, and those can't be paid for if you always have, you know, 0%, so. And I was, I was at Boy Memorial again today, I go there a lot, and um, you, you'd be surprised, just be, if you just hear street talk versus going to Boy Memorial and see what a terrific high school it is, how clean it is, how safe it is. I talked to an AP class, a bunch of terrific, um, seniors who are now going on. I was asking where they were going. They're all going on somewhere really, really important. And then I went to Converse, and uh, that's elementary school on kind of the near west side of Beloit. And uh, terrific things going on there. The expansion is going to be terrific. The, um, the, Beloit, the taxpayers of Beloit agreed to a $70 million referendum last April. And uh, now we're seeing it. I know you've, you've been on top of it too, but it's uh, the Stephanie Jacobs, the, the principal there, and the the faculty and every, it's and the fourth graders they had them they had questions ready for me when I got to this fourth grade class and uh, some of them were pretty tough including how old I am. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, they, they knew better. <laughs> but it was it's just I think it's a, I think it's the greatest untold story in this state is how well Beloit is doing not only the city but the school district and uh, it's, it's got this unfair reputation which is was sullied again a few days ago on Milwaukee Talk Radio, yeah. where somebody had the audacity to say that the graduation rate in Beloit is 40%, um, when it's 83.6, and with the legacy program, they have a great program in Beloit. If you don't graduate with a class, but you stick with it, they, they want to stick, they want to, they follow the kid, they want the kid to graduate. If the kid stays there and comes back the next year, if they can get their diploma by the time they're, before they're 21, um, they can do that. And if you, at the 83.6 plus the legacy kids, it's like 93.6 graduation rate. And somebody says in Milwaukee Talk Radio that it's 40%. Well, 
that never ever gets never get that genie back in a bottle when stuff like that gets said. But it's a, we we did present that. Well, I, I could go on and blow it. I'm sorry, I, but it's a great story. We had to stop the vouchers. Um, Petitions and we delivered them yesterday and actually Superintendent McNeil was up there and he was a little bit angry at um, Senator Darling for stating that um, falsehood. So she, posted, she posted an apology on uh, Charlie Sykes' website but, oh. but not never got in the air. Oh. But now we know. And she apologized to me and said she, and she told me directly she wants to come to Boyd, so. Andrew, actually, you might want to go over to that one. Yeah, there might. This one seems to be working for her. I'll try. John Jackson from Janesville. Uh, follow up on what uh, she was just talking about. You're talking about mental uh, health. Uh, that's kind of related to Medicaid and Badger Care, Badger Care Plus. And I came in late, so I don't know if you discussed that issue, but uh, we're talking about losing several millions of dollars by not uh, participating in the federal program. And what I can't quite figure out is, uh, why would we do that? To punish our president. Yes, I know. Um, truthfully, the, the 4.4 billion, this is over a 10 year period of time, $4.4 billion would come in and save the state hundreds of millions of dollars of GPR dollars, um, probably serve another hundred, an extra 175,000 175, people, um, create, I'm going to guess, up to 10,000 jobs. Um, I'm not, I, there's no part of me that understands that, why you would turn those dollars away. At any point in time, if you decided Seriously, this isn't, I mean, because they're going to, the federal government's going to pick up, a hundred, right now they pay 40% um, or 60%? The feds pay 60%. 60%. They would pick up 100% of the Medicaid dollars for the first four years, and then after that it goes down to 90 92%. So I, I do not understand it at all. Um, there's, and it's funny because it's turned some allies um, for the Republican Party into, uh, Democrats for a moment, when it, the healthcare industry is um, is kind of in an uproar. Besides, besides, it's just the right thing to do to take care of those 175,000 people, not keep kick people off of Badger Care. Now we'll have families that the children will be on Badger Care, but the parents won't be because we'll go down to 100 percent of poverty. So um, I I don't, I don't understand why we're doing it. I really don't. Is there a target date? I'm sorry, but is there a target date to eliminate what's there now, or is it just still? Well, being when the when the um, exchanges come online, which would be the exchanges are supposed to be uh, start being operational in October, ready for testing, and then in, on January 1st, we're supposed to, the exchanges are supposed to be up. But the exchanges are going to there will be a premium, even though they be subsidized up to 400 percent of poverty. They'll be subsidized, but there still will be a premium. Plus, there'll be cost sharing, you know, co pays, um, deductibles. If you are earning $11,000 a year as a, a single person and you have to pay, I don't know, let's just say $1,500 or $2,000 in um, premiums and deductibles, that doesn't correlate to living. You know, so I I'm concerned that they won't be able to sign up and. So the penalty will be, it'll be a effect here, you'll get charged a penalty on your income tax. Well, 11,000 probably, you're not filing anyway. So, I mean, there will still be so many people that will fall through the cracks. There's really only one explanation. Um, if you want to run for president in the other party, you cannot have your fingers touch anything that has anything to do with Obamacare. And this Medicaid expansion, is part of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And the governor will have nothing to do with it. He turned down the federal money to build the exchange, to have a Wisconsin developed insurance exchange. Um, and it's the only explanation that makes any sense. Now, the good news is there's there's several, I keep talking about, there's several Republican state senators who think this is just lunacy and they're not going to stand for it. And the question is, how, how tough are they going to hold? Um, they, they all get it. They're all hearing from their, not only from 
uh, low-income people are here. Now, after, after all, Medicaid money doesn't go to low-income people. It pays for their health care. The money goes to providers, docs, and hospitals. And the hospitals are going nuts over this, as Deb mentioned, because this is like lunacy. Why would you um, not take this money? And and then the argument, well, they're not really knocking them off of health care because they're going to go get their insurance on the exchange. As Deb talked about, insurance changes that were not intended for families of three making 18 grand and haven't paid up to 2000 out of pocket. How would you pay $2,000 out of pocket annually for health care when you're making 18 grand to support three people? I mean, that's not what's going to happen, but that's the, that's the cover as well. We're not really knocking them off health care. Yeah, they're off Medicaid, but they're going to get it through the exchange. Um, it's just, it's bizarre, but there are several people in the state Senate uh, in both parties who think it's lunacy, and we, we may we may actually win on this one. Yeah. Uh, it, it may only be a on one-year or two-year extension, but we'll take whatever we can get. Because the exchanges are not going to be ready on October 1st, uh, and where are, they, where are these people going to be? Well, actually, I volunteer at HealthNet, or I did until I got this in. The number of people that come in there that have jobs, I mean, the, the vast majority are working. They just, when you make $8 an hour, you can't buy insurance, you know. Or if you can afford the insurance, that's nothing. It's, okay, so now I owe a $25,000 deductible, the, you know, so you get catastrophic insurance. Well, what does that mean to you? You're never going to pay that off if something happens. And then you start over the next year. So. Those uh, uh, good-minded folks that you're talking about, uh, Senator, uh, <clears throat> uh, are they approachable? And do you want to share that at some time? Who are their encouragement? Yeah, there, there's um, public and senators that are really concerned about this issue are, are Senator Ellis, Senator, Senator Ellis, Senator Schultz, Senator Coles, Senator Olson, at least four of them. And there's, there's more behind them who are kind of trying to keep their head down, but I agree with them. So Ellis Schultz? Coles, um, C-O-W-L-E-S, mm -hmm. and, um, and Olson, Luther Olson. You know, and this can be SE, approached. Well, I recognize the, the names. This can be approached from so many levels. I mean, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Um, it, it will provide for better, a cheaper health care for the general public. I mean, if these people are not going anywhere, and if they're not on some insurance, they're going to be in the ER. I mean, so somebody's going to be paying for that. But it's also the job creation. Nothing, seriously, nothing we've done in the assembly so far, well, we haven't done anything as far as job creation goes in the assembly, so that was, it was an easy one. But it would actually create jobs, and probably better paying jobs than a lot. So We're really lucky to have both of you involved in, uh, in this topic because you've been involved in the system for a long time in your, your career. And Senator, I know, I know that you were very active in the insurance business before as well. So you really understand what's going on. There. I know, also ran the Medicaid system for two years when I was a cabinet secretary. A while ago, 25 years ago. Did you? I was going to say something. Do you want to speak, sir? Anyone else? Well, we certainly appreciate you coming here, and uh, we'll probably stick around for a while to chit chat, but not with our microphones on. So, anyway, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I appreciate it.